Well, this is the first of three videos on the chemistry of enols and enolates. We're nearing the end of this journey through OCHEM 2 sort of topics. OCHEM 1, remembering way back, we looked at just structure and how if we understand structure well, we under understand reactivity. And just to give a sort of big, big picture view of where we've been and where we're going, after looking at structure, we looked at stereochemistry of structures. We've looked at, in the very beginning, we've looked at not just stereochemistry, but naming of structures. So really starting off with understanding resonance forms, partial charges, acidity, basicity of structure, sort of the, I would say, foundation, the core, was understanding partial charges, uh, hybridization. Those fit in the center. But coming out from that, we looked at stereochemistry, naming of compounds. And one of the first reactions we started discussing was the reaction of alkyl halides, where X is some leaving group. And we talked about how nucleophiles can act as a base or as a nucleophile towards an alkyl halide, i.e. they can attack a proton at the beta position, acting as a base, this thing that's negative, or it could come in and attack a carbon. So you had reactions like SN2 and E2 that competed with each other, and you had E1 and SN1 that could occur together, or depending upon the nucleophile, its nature, may give you more S in one product, but all of that shook out from an alkyl halide reacting with a nucleophile, or was part of that story. And then looking at types of electrophilic addition reactions, where the attacking nucleophile of this electrophile, whatever it might be, protons, bromines, be in Br2, an alkene could have an electrophilic addition reaction, so could alkyne, and even dyes can react with electrophiles. So that was something that was looked at. And the alkynes, there was a special story in how alkynes can be attacked by a base to make an acetylide anion. But this was the narrative for the most part. Different electrophiles added to double bonds, triple bonds, and dyes. And then going into sort of OCHEM 2, we kind of picked up with the story of alcohols, ethers, epoxides, and how if protonated, the alcohol gave us a good leaving group, just like we saw with alkyl halides, and we could have weak nucleophiles come in and attack as nucleophiles or as bases towards protonated alcohols, and even protonated ethers could react in the very same way. And epoxides could react with weak nucleophiles, just like alkyl halides. They could react with nucleophiles that can attack as nucleophiles or as bases. In the case of alcohols, we said that the nucleophile of polarizable, bromide, chloride, would give more substitution product. But if the nucleophile was just water, left after protonation of this oxygen, we could have more E1 chemistry. So there was a lot of overlap between the reactions of alkyl halides and nucleophiles and the reactions of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides in the protonated form with something in solution that's partially negative or negative. Epoxides were unique in that they can react without acids because of their ring strain. And so we said both in acids or in bases, because of the ring strain, epoxides can react with strong or weak nucleophiles. They can pop open in acid or base conditions. And then in OCHEM 2, looking at just you know beyond, I know we talk about spectroscopy, but I'm just sort of looking at structure and reactivity in this little sort of summary. We had benzene ring that could react with electrophiles or if we had a benzene ring and at least one leaving group, or a, I should say a leaving group, whatever that might be, we could have strong nucleophiles coming in and attacking benzene rings. And it helped if you wanted to have greater reactivity, it helped to have electron withdrawing groups by resonance at ortho or para positions or both to give this 
a greater partial positive charge at this carbon that the leaving group is connected to. So we talked about NAS, nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. We've looked at EAS, electrophilic aromatic substitution, where the benzene ring was attacking the electrophile. And in this case, we wanted donating groups to help this along. And in this case, the NAS, we wanted withdrawing groups at ortho and para positions to help move this reaction along. Now we're kind of nearing the end of OCHEM 2, and really I'm going to sort of divide our discussion of carbonyls into two camps. This sort of picks up with where we were at the beginning of our discussion of acyl substitution and acyl addition. We said in these two cases, acyl substitution, acyl addition. This one seems to be in general more favored for the most part because we breathe in, breathe out. But we did say in this case the carbonyl is the focus, but in these two reactions, addition, acyl addition or acyl substitution, the nucleophile at some point attacks this carbon and we either have with acyl substitution a leaving group here or with addition just alkyl groups and hydrogens at these two positions off the carbonyl. But the point was they share this in common. At some point the nucleophile makes an attack on the carbon. It may be without protonation of this oxygen because the carbonyl is that reactive or it may need, that, may need to be protonated here before the nucleophile can attack. Alright, that said where we are right now is we're not looking at a different functional group. We're still going to look at the carbonyl but what we're going to do is not consider just nucleophilic acyl substitution or acyl addition and all the types of products we can have by attacking the carbon. Class 1's go with acyl substitution with leaving group and these are without leaving group, the class 2. But now we want to focus on not attacking the carbon as a nucleophile but attacking the proton, this is going to be called the alpha proton, that's on the carbon next to the carbonyl. Attacking that proton, if we start by attacking as a base, as compared to attacking as a nucleophile, and these are in competition to each other, the green and the red, it's not either or, we have competition. If we look at that as a first step, we're starting to consider enol and enolate chemistry. Enol this is going to be in acid conditions and enolate chemistry base conditions. So we're going to talk about at some point this alpha proton being abstracted by something in solution whether it be an acid solution or in base solution. And that's going to be really the end of the story for the most part this long journey that we've taken through OCHEM is discussion of the nucleophile not acting as a nucleophile it's still going to have some rich amount of electron density whether partial negative or full negative but we're going to key in on what's called the alpha position the alpha position we're going to extract proton abstraction I guess we're going to abstract a proton from the alpha position what is the alpha position it's next to the carbonyl remember that so for the next three videos we'll be looking at what happens if we take away that proton? What kind of chemistry can we have? So let's look at that and we'll get started. Oh, before I move on, I did want to point out that we had looked at the order of reactivity of different class 1, class 2 carbonyls together. Acyl halides were most reactive and amides were on the other end and we had in this order anhydrides, aldehydes, ketones, um, ethers, sorry, um, esters and carboxylic acids will be about equal. Folks, it doesn't matter whether the nucleophile is coming in and attacking the carbons or it's attacking the proton, this order of reactivity remains the same. So these are more acidic than the amides if we are dealing with a alkylated amide here, but I'm talking about this carbon, his proton, alpha proton, is less acidic than this alpha proton on the acyl halide. We can follow the partial charges of the carbonyls. The more partially positive it is, the more reactive it is directly to be attacked, as in red, 
but also more acidic is the proton. So that's important to remember. So what we're going to do with this video is we're just going to look at alpha halogenation through enols and then just kind of review the big picture before we get started on enolates. So let's get to the big picture first. First things first, we need to know what an enol and an enolate, what they are, so that we can understand some of the chemistry that they give us. So I don't have colors here, but this should be blue because we're going to consider our ketones and aldehydes that can go to enols and enolates to be in slightly acidic solutions, so just a catalytic amount of acid. Well, we know what we would do, we would protonate this oxygen, but if we do that, what we can get is a loss of that alpha proton from the R group to create an ene, an alkene. And since we have the OH now present from that carbonyl, we call this an enol, and this carbon would have by resonance a partial negative charge. That's what's wanting to put here is a little bit of a partial negative charge. Even though we're in acid conditions, we still have a reactive nucleophile in the enol, the ene alkene connected to an OH. This is called an enol. All right, so it can come from a ketone or an aldehyde, but the general name is not um, aldol and enol, it's just enol. We call this alcohol off of an alkene made from an aldehyde or a ketone. We call that an enol. That's in acid conditions. Now this is supposed to be red, meaning we have base conditions. If we have base conditions, we don't, we don't have protonation of this oxygen to start things off. We have, sh have abstraction directly of the protons on either side of this carbonyl if we have a ketone. So I've shown a CH2 group as if this was a methyl group. We would make a CH2 group here that has a full negative. Not a partial negative as on our enolate. So it's a full negative form of the enol. Where we have a enolate. And you say, well I don't see the con this, I don't see how this is related to the enol. Well draw a resonance form and you will. So let's put a double headed arrow here. Let's consider resonance for the enolate. I draw it in this form. Most of your books will show it in a different form. Or maybe some will. But I like to leave it in the form where in most of your reactions occur from this carbon in the enolate ion, not from the oxygen. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So we could draw the resonance form and see how it is indeed the conjugate base of the enol. It's the conjugate base. So that's how do we draw a resonance form for a negative? You always start at the negative and move away. So lone pair to pi, pi to lone pair. And I think you'll see how indeed this then makes sense. It's the conjugate base of the enol. The enol minus this proton is the enolate. We're not talking about two different structures. We're talking about resonance forms. So I'm going to leave it in this resonance form, the less contributing resonance form, because we tend to see reactivity through this carbon and not through this oxygen. All right, so we'll pick up on enolate chemistry in the second and third video. But let's focus in on the enol. Can we draw them from the ketones or aldehydes? So we'll focus in on that and we'll get to the base chemistry. We're going to talk about just one reaction involving acids and ketones and aldehydes. That's alpha halogenation. We're going to look at just one reaction after we consider this transformation of ketones to enols, which is called tautomerization. So we'll look at the chemistry here. We've already done this one. We're going to look. This is our focus. We'll get there. We'll look at using abstraction of a proton to give an enol or an enolate. Enolate or an enol. But let's look at just how to draw enols. Tautomerization is defined as the interconversion between two substances or rearrangement. So we can say, hey, we have a keto to enol tautomerization. So an interconversion between the keto and enol form of a compound. They are not resonance forms. There is a reaction. At least this is not resonance. We're transferring a atom from one place to another. So we can draw enols from the keto tautomer. The keto tautomer is a general term. It can be applied to ketones or aldehydes. 
We can draw those by going to the alpha position. In the ketone or aldehyde, you have to have an alpha proton. This is an alpha proton. It's off of an alpha carbon. Alpha carbon is being defined by this carbonyl as a unit. We're one atom away. Alpha, beta, such as you'd keep on going, gamma, or whatever. This is the first position from the carbonyl. So it's called the alpha proton. This is the alpha carbon. We have to have at least one alpha proton to have an enol that could form. Because we're going to take that away, pull it off, and move it up to the oxygen. And we would have an enol where the carbon is partially negative. And the proton here would be partially positive, just as the oxygen would also be because it's donating, donating its electron donating to this carbon through resonance form. We can have a OH pushing in to make this carbon here nucleophilic, making it partially negative. Now, this tautomerization, this keto to enol tautomerization, is present whenever you have a ketone or an aldehyde. You have some amount, small amount of the enol, significant amount or large amount of the keto tautomer. Very small, very large amount of the keto tautomer in general. So we're not going to change the amount of these two that we form by adding an acid catalyst. What we're going to do is change the rate of reaction from the keto to enol tautomer or back the other way. It's a faster transformation now that we can have if we're in catalytic conditions. So addition of acid does not shift the equilibrium one way or the other, but simply allows for a more rapid reaction between the keto form and the enol form of the compound. So we just want a slightly lower than pH 7 solution. Let's look at, um, and, oh, I forgot. Let's talk about why the keto form is favored. Just generally, carbonyls are like an acyl substitution. You wanted to reform the carbonyl because there's some strength, ionic bonding there, that we have in the carbonyl, the CO double bond, that we want to regain. So the keto form has a carbonyl. The enol does not. The CO in a polar environment has more stability than the CC double bond. All right. Let's look at some of the conversions between keto to enol forms. And I'm going to have the enols we've drawn here. And we can take and say I would know what the keto forms would be for each of these. But we also want to know just a little bit of why, in some cases, the rule is broken. The rule that keto forms are more significant in expression or uh, uh, presence in solution is greater. The enol form, we usually have less of it. There are some exceptions, and let's go through that. So the OH in the enol tautomer donates electron density to the carbon here. We know that. That's very important in terms of its reactivity. But in some cases, we don't see a small amount of that enol. We see a large amount. So let's talk about some of those cases. Phenol is one of them. We know the OH donates electron density to the ortho and para positions. We see that through resonance as illustrated here for this simple enol. The OH gives to the lone pair down to the carbon. These electrons can bump up to the carbon here. We have, a, of course, a charged structure. These are resonance forms of each other, and we can't say, even though it's charged, that it's nil in its contribution. No, it's still significant, even though it's a minor resonance form. We would say, oh, back on the neutral structure, this is partially negative, this is partially positive. And you've done the same thing, if you've gone through the videos, you've done the same thing for phenol. 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 No, so we see the enol in the name phenol that we have for this compound. We've already seen that. But just for fun, could we draw the keto tautomer for phenol? Well, think about that proton that went on to this oxygen. We'd have to take it back off and put it here at these positions. Give us the most recognizable form of the keto tautomer. Oops. Well, put that back here. So we have that pi bond remaining, and we'd put the proton 
on this oxygen, we put it here. It doesn't matter. I could have put it here, here, or even here, but we'll just put it on this side. This is not a pi bond here. We didn't have that. And we would put the pi bond back to the oxygen. So let's just redraw that. We could say we have the keto form if we take the proton off that oxygen put it back on this carbon that's partially negative this would be the keto form now why in this case is the key the phenol more stable than the keto form tautomer of phenol I hope you see it's because of aromaticity that because the phenol is aromatic but the keto tautomer of the phenol structure is not this would be non aromatic not anti-aromatic, but just non-aromatic because we have an sp3 carbon wherein we had at the beginning an sp2 carbon. So in this case, phenol is more, I guess, favorable in solution than the keto form of phenol. We can also have cases where we have an ene all that's stabilized through hydrogen bonding. Let's see if we can go, and we can see that if we have the OH off this carbon in the enol next to a carbonyl we can get a six-membered ring. We get hydrogen bonding stabilizing the enol. How would we draw the keto form? We would go after that proton in the OH and put it on the alpha carbon that's partially negative. So we could draw that proton being given to this carbon and this would be the keto form of the enol where the proton here has gone back to the alpha position. And we can do the same thing here. This is one of the keto forms for this um, enol. So here we just have a little bit of conjugation. This is not an aromatic structure going to non-aromatic, but it's a more conjugated structure wherein the lone pair here is connected through pi bonding with the pi bond down here but here we have a disconnect the pi electrons between the C and the O are no longer overlapping or interacting in conjugation with the pi bond here so these are just three ways in which we can have more expression of the enol the greatest one is aromaticity phenol is heavily favored over the keto form of phenol in the case of a neighboring carbonyl that does give us a significant amount of this enol compared to the ketone that we have here, this 1,3-diketone. And then the conjugation, very little bit of this would be favored. But we can get a little bit more than we'd expect because we have conjugation extending all the way out from the oxygen to the carbon here. It may give us a little bit more expression of this enol than we would typically expect. All right, that's the structure of enols and ketones. So you may want to get good at taking any structure and being able to draw the enol from the keto form, the aldehyde or ketone, or having the enol be able to go the other way. That's an important skill. I want to close the video just by looking at alpha halogenation of an aldehyde or ketone. And what we're going to do is we're going to have to work through the enol, work through the enol. So we're going to have to be able to draw the enol. Alpha halogenation of an aldehyde or ketone, and I should be careful, working through the enol if we don't have a strong base. If we see there is no strong base anywhere, then we have to start proposing, if we're going to have alpha halogenation, we have to start proposing an enol. Because if you have no strong base, you can't go to enolate. And if we want to have some chemistry going on here, alpha halogenation, we have to go to enol. Because as it is right now, this carbon has no ability to act as a nucleophile. There are no sigma, or sorry, there are no pi bonds off this carbon that I've highlighted, and there are no lone pair electrons. You can't do any chemistry with that then. So we have to change its form. And again, you'll recognize that by saying, hey, all I have is Br2. That could provide an electrophilic bromine. I have a solvent, but I don't have any strong base. Go to enol. So if you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and take this in a reaction. And I know it's reversible. We're going to go ahead and draw the enol. So how do we do, how do, we do that? We need to draw the enol. Remember, 
we go to the alpha position. So now I'm going to pick this side, the ethyl group, over the methyl. Because if we're going to enol, we want to have more substituents around the carbon-carbon double, double bond that we're going to form. We want to have the most substituents, most alkyl groups. Well, of course, the double bond here, we'd have two hydrogens. The double bond here, we'd have at least one methyl group and a hydrogen. So I'm going to take this proton from the alpha position to get to the enol that's present in solution, the little bit of enol that we have with any ketone or aldehyde in solution. So how do I draw it? We take that proton and where do we put it? On the oxygen here. So we have in the end an OH and our en, our enol. And I can point this up or down, I'm not going to worry about stereochemistry. We have our en all. And you say, well, how much of it? Well, not much, because this is not this is not aromatic. There's no uh, conjugation or hydrogen bonding that's going to stabilize this. So it's itty bitty, but it still gives us this is key a nucleophilic carbon that we need at the alpha position. We have that nucleophilic carbon now. We can reach out. This is partially negative. We can reach out and attack this partially positive in time. Maybe this polarizability of the bromine. We can attack one of those two bromines and start thinking about having alpha halogenation. Now I've shown the balanced reaction here. Alpha halogenation in, I guess, non-base conditions. We stop once. We have mono halogenation as our favored product. Remember that in non-basic solutions we just have mono halogenation. We'll talk a little bit about why that is the case. And we generate HBr. So this is a re reaction that catalyzes itself. It's called an autocatalytic reaction. Because as we said, the enol, although it's present in solution with any ketone or aldehyde, we can make it faster if we have a little bit of acid in solution. Well, that's great. We generate in this balanced reaction, we generate HBr. One of the bromines switches out with this hydrogen, and of course the hydrogen switches out with this bromine and bonds to the other one to give us a strong acid. So that's the balanced reaction. Ketones, Br2 or Cl2 can be used. And some sort of aprotic solvent. We can have our ketone, halogenated ketone at the alpha position and HBr. Reaction favors monohalogenation. We've talked about that, but we'll see why on the next slide. The reaction, the alpha position becomes susceptible to nucleophilic to as a nucleophile because we can see we have a partial negative charge and also if we have the halogenation that alpha position becomes susceptible to SN2 reactions. So that's where this is going. The product can go through now an SN2 reaction. Acid formed in the reaction acts as a catalyst increasing the rate of enol formation which increases the rate of reaction. Chlorine, bromine, and even iodine may be used for this reaction. Bromine is the most common. Let's look at the mechanism and we'll be done. So if we had, after some time, the reaction going, we know we'd generate some HBr. So I'm going to go ahead and show that effect. We could protonate this oxygen. That's the first thing we always do with strong acids, the catalytic amounts or or whatever, we can protonate this oxygen. If we protonate this oxygen, that increases the acidity of this proton that we've highlighted here. Because if this carbon was partially negative to begin with, protonating this oxygen makes it even more partially positive. We see that through the resonance form. So this should really be a single arrow, double-headed arrow. We see that this carbon becomes more, partially, more positive, which increases the acidity of that proton. That then can allow it to be picked off. We can make the enol, the enol, and that enol now can be used to attack the Br2. We know this is partially negative by resonance, so we're going to reach out with the pi electrons. This lone pair is pushing in, so I'm going to go ahead and draw that we would have the pi bond forming between the O and the C, kind of pushing out these pi electrons towards the bromine here and kicking off bromide. So we have this plus bromide. But the enol now has been halogenated at the alpha position. And we've created a, a, a pro proton that's acidic because we had the O donating the lone pair down 
as we picked up the bromine at the alpha position. So I know I can draw a resonance form of this structure, the positive charge is shared between the carbon, but we see that this has become very acidic. The bromide or water can pick that up from the solution and we make our final product, our final alpha halogenated product. We work through the more substituted position that's generally favored than the alpha position that's less substituted. We favored this position. Um, we also formed more acid so we can catalyze this reaction. It can go even faster and such. I also want to point out one more thing. We don't see multiple halogenation of this for this reason. The bromine we know if it's an sp3 carbon here we have an electron withdrawing group. So putting an electron withdrawing group on this carbon causes instability if we were to protonate the carbonyl because we'd have a positive next to a positive. So that's why the product kind of comes out of solution no longer reacting with the Br2 or making going to reaction because the product is less basic for the most part. We have an electron withdrawing group. We don't want to protonate this oxygen. The enol that's non-halogenated does not have electron withdrawing groups can more easily be protonated. So we favor monohalogenation. We favor monohalogenation. That's it. That's our only reaction that I'll be discussing in terms of enol chemistry. Whatever an enolate can do, an enol can do, but for the next two videos we're just going to look at enolate chemistry. What we can do if we are in base conditions. That's it. Bye-bye.